Hello everyone, it's Benny, and welcome back to the audio programming tutorial series. Today, we're going to take a look at three things. First, we're going to look at how digital audio actually works. Second, we're going to look at how your computer goes about playing digital audio. And third and finally, we're going to go back to our simple wave player and really explain and understand how that's, well, really working. So those are the three things we're going to be doing in this video. There's no code, so just sit back and enjoy. Let's begin. So, how does digital audio work? How can you possibly take actual sound waves, a real sound, and store it in a computer? And the answer is very simple. It might not be immediately obvious why it works, but it's pretty simple. You sample it. You take samples of what the sound is like. Now you might be wondering, how do you sample a sound with its volume? How loud is the sound at a certain point in time? So that's what you do. You'll sample the sound wave, you'll take a certain number of samples per second, and that's called the sample rate, or the frequency, and eventually you end up with this big whopping array of samples. This big array of how loud the sound was at various points in time. And that's it. That's all there is to digital audio. That is how it, it looks on the inside. And like I said, it might not be immediately obvious, how this is a satisfactory representation of a real sound. But if I draw it as a bar graph, things suddenly make a lot more sense. If you follow the shape of this bar graph, assuming each bar represents a sample, of course, then you see the shape of the bar graph looks an awful lot like this original sound wave. And of course, as you take more and more samples, it'll get more and more like the original sound wave. And as it turns out, after you're sampling about 44,100 samples per second, the sound is virtually indistinguishable from the original sound wave, at least within the range of human hearing. So there you go. That is how digital audio works. So, now that we understand how digital audio works, let's talk about output devices. These can be something like speakers, headphones, earbuds, basically anything that can take digital audio and turn it back into real sound is an output device. Now I'm not going to talk about how these work in this video. All I'm going to talk about are the properties of these devices that you as a programmer should care about. And the two biggest, by far, if you get nothing else out of this part, the two properties you should know about are the samples and the callback. And you might be wondering, well, what are these? And these have to do with how the output device works. Internally, every output device has its own array of samples, its own little snippet of digital audio, if you will. And this is whatever part, whatever piece of digital audio it happens to be playing at that moment. And the way it works is we'll start at the beginning, It'll play a sample, then play the next sample, then play the next sample, and the next, and the next, and the next, and so on, until it reaches the end of its internal audio snippet. And that's, that's the samples. That's what that little internal buffer is for. But once it reaches the end, that's where the callback comes into play. It will call this callback function, and it will pass in a pointer to its internal samples array. And what it expects is this callback function will refill the samples array with, well, with audio. With the next piece of audio it's supposed to be playing. And it'll play that. Play first sample, next sample, so on, until it reaches the end of that snippet again. The call the callback to get the next snippet, play that, and so forth, and so on. And that's the way these devices sort of tick internally. Now, there's more properties of these you might care about. 
Like, sometimes there might be multiple channels, there might be different formats, might play at a different frequency than you expect. But the nice thing is that all these properties you might care about, in SDL at least, are encapsulated in the SDL audio spec. And the reason that's sort of nice is because you can specify things like frequency or format or channels to be just whatever the audio you're playing has as frequency or format or channels. And by using SDL Open Audio Device, SDL will just find the audio device that most closely matches that. So those other properties aren't as big of a deal. The big thing you need to know about are the samples and the callback, because that's the way audio devices tick internally. One more subtle detail I'd like to mention, though, before I go, is there's some subtle multi-threading going on in here. The callback function is being called by the audio device. That means that's happening within the audio device's thread. And that can cause some subtle multi-threading issues. It can potentially cause things like synchronization or deadlock issues that you all know and love. So just be aware of that. Be careful what you do in the callback function, because this is being called from a separate thread. And yeah, that's really all you need to know about the output device. If you get the samples and the callback thing, you're good. So, now that we've talked about how digital audio works, and a bit about output devices, this program should make a lot more sense to you. For instance, right here, we're loading a WAV file. What does that mean? It means we're finding some array of samples, some array of how loud the audio is at various points in time, and we're storing it in WAV start. And nicely enough, it's also creating some audio spec, some specification of an output device for, that could potentially play this audio. And that way, when we call open device with this specification, it will find some output device that can, well, actually play the audio. And we can use the play function with this device to play the WAV file. But how does the device play the WAV file? Well, it has its own internal array of audio sample, of digital audio. And every time it runs out, it will call my audio callback, because we set that as the callback. So, every time it runs out of samples, it'll go in here and copy audio from the, way the samples we loaded into the audio device's internal audio buffer. And from there, we update the data, wait for the next time it calls, and it'll just keep doing that until the program has ended. So, you're free, and I would recommend you taking more looks at this program on your own, and tr getting a little bit more understanding of how it works, because it really shouldn't be that bad now. You should be able to work out a lot more details on your own. And yeah, so that's just about all I wanted to cover in this video. I'll leave a few links in the description for some extra reading you can do if you like. But now that we understand this, now that we know how digital audio works and output devices and stuff, you know, all the stuff we did in this program seems pretty cumbersome to do just to play a bit of audio. How can we set things up so things are a bit more organized? It's a lot easier to play audio like this. Find out next time on the Audio Programming Tutorial Series. Hope you enjoyed, hope you learned, and I'll see you then.